Explicity Cast from Explicity. It's settled. We move next month. The demolishers will arrive then. They will start with the front. That may be easy to pull down the new portion. This may be a little more difficult. They made tough buildings in the old days and tough people. But even tough people like my father get knocked down. We have moved to our flat. A posh flat. Our balcony overlooks the top of a gulmohar tree. They were planning to cut it off and tow. It obstructs the traffic. But it was saved by a group of retired old men in this building. I think I was one of them. Did I tell you Lata had called when you had gone to visit Chandrakala? She was happy to know that you two are the best of friends. I told her how much you two have in common. Arthritis to start with. She called to say that her baby spoke her first word today. It sounded like jalebi. Today my liver ceased to function and I followed suit. you died too after boredom my suspect our flat is empty now it belongs to lata and vishwas i see you coming to what seems to be heaven riding with death on a buffalo you get off and i greet you the buffalo vanishes and we embrace we smile and we dance We dance perfectly in unison not missing a step or a beat We were only human we lack the grace we lack the brilliance we lack the magic to dance like god In the days before we had all but outsourced our imagination to TV there were plays Something about sitting in a theater watching actors live on stage moves the needle for us in a way that movies don't. At a time when amateur theater in India, both English language and regional, were popular, English language theater groups staged productions based on scripts that they could easily find at the library, for example. Typically, these were playwrights like William Shakespeare, Tom Stoppard, Tennessee Williams, the usual suspects. And then my guest today, the celebrated playwright Mahesh Datani, started to write his own plays. The result, he brought India into English language theatre, and he gave us urban Indian stories to which we could relate, culturally, socially, and especially emotionally. When he started to write, he was still in Saint Joseph's College in Bangalore. Not only did Mahesh and I go to the same college. but we lived in the same neighborhood right from then there was a quietly self assured air about mahesh which i surmised was because he was practicing to be a star in any event he remains a person of great equanimity approachable and friendly to the delight of fans gaggles of them i attest i have seen approach him bending low a hand outstretched timorously just in case he bites while mahesh datani happily is not unsung i think india owes him much more of a song and maybe that'll happen soon as for the rest of us let's be happy that he didn't pursue the family business of selling machine parts or whatever boring enterprise they were up to mahesh told me that had he studied to be an engineer that would have been his career i dare say that he would have been less happy in the theater of selling ball bearings even if they were double row and deep groove with filling slots and now Mahesh Datani welcome to the literary city <laughs> Ramji I I don't know whether this is a throwback to I don't know 40 years ago when I walked into your home and of course I met your lovely mother and then I met you you were like the college icon of uh, music and everything and there you were sitting there and I was having this conversation with you do you remember that at all <laughs> Uh I do remember meeting you of course but I don't remember much of the conversation that we had. Wait a minute, <laughs> yeah. you remember it that me 
Should I be apologizing for something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you should. I think you should, because I'll tell you why you should apologize. Uh -oh. uh, because I think that was the close of a beautiful artistic relationship. End of an artisting relationship? Why? <laughs> well, I came to you with a proposal to do a play. I wanted you to act in it because you were quite a star in college and I thought having you in it and something told me you will make a good actor because you had this marvelous singing voice and this amazing presence and uh, something said that, yes, I, I think, you know, he's going to be my star actor in all my plays from now on. And I said it and you, you laughed and you said you were not an actor and you would be very uncomfortable trying to remember lines or whatever you... I think you just made your excuses to get rid of me at that point. Casting me in a play? I think you dodged a bullet, Mahesh. But I must hand it to you. We had a lovely conversation. Uh, we spoke for over an hour. So it was, it was a day that I remember very fondly. Well, that's nice of you to say, but acting? It petrifies me. <laughs> but still... What kind of moron would have turned down the chance to act with the great Mahesh Datani? <laughs> I'll tell you, this kind of idiot. <laughs> so, we were still in college. That's right. Let's say that we were smart teenagers. Yeah, that's nice. I love that. What made you a smart teenager? Why did you start to write? Well, I, I think it's to do with uh, with being young is that you think you know and you, uh, you're smart. Uh, you have an opinion about things. And so you just exude a certain confidence. Uh, my theory is that going through a phase where you think you know, even if you don't, is not such a bad thing. I mean, it's different from being pretentious. Uh, it's uh, somewhere deep down you, you believe that you're talented, you believe that you know a lot. And then along the journey, of course, you sober down, you, you realize that you don't know uh, as much as you think you did, and uh, you begin to question yourself, you begin to doubt yourself. And then at some point, you, you are unsure. And that, I think, is the moment where, uh, where the real learning begins. And learning as an artist, is possible when there's patronage. Now, corporate India used to be more generous than it is today. Do you remember? That's right. I remember. Remember Kumar Iyengar uh, with ITC. I remember A.C. Das. He had this sweet shop around the corner just opposite Koshi's. And I don't think there was ever a time when I was doing a play and I walked into either ITC or KC Das where they did not give me a sponsorship. I was never turned down. Yeah. True. It was when corporate India supported the arts and it was not just all about ROI and questions like, oh, how many people will smoke my cigarettes? That's right. There was a phase and a transition in your life and career. So I have a two-part question. First, what inspired you to write or who inspired you to write? Mm. And two, what motivated you to write your own plays? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty early on. Uh, I think in college, yes, I was very keen to do theater. And the scripts that, uh, that were available to me were from the British Council, uh, right? Uh, there were all the Samuel French uh, publications and things. And of course, I remember dear Jyoti Makhija sort of hunting out scripts. And I remember my very first encounter with her was I went up to her and said, do you have any plays written by Samuel French? You know? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, smiled and said, Samuel French is the publisher. Well, I hope you read that wonderful author HarperCollins in that case. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. He's right up there with Simon and Schuster. Oh, the scary <laughs> siblings of scripts. Absolutely. <laughs> Major writers. <laughs> yeah. Writing Scripts for plays is a commitment. Yeah. What drove you? I was directing plays, uh, you know, by uh, Sartre. Now, the thing is, I happened to accompany my dad on a business tour to Bombay. And I did see a play in Hindi uh, at Prithvi Theatre. And 
I realized that the audiences were so taken with the action that there was a huge spontaneous round of applause right there in the middle of the performance, right? Okay, now this audience is so connected with what's going on stage. My audience isn't. And I thought about it and I said, why am I doing these European plays, which, uh, you know, audiences cannot connect with, uh, maybe just on an intellectual level, maybe, but as, as a piece of drama, it's not mirroring their lives. So I thought, why not try my hand at writing? And that's how I began to write. I wrote Where There's a Will, which was uh, for the uh, Deccan Herald Theatre Festival. So the scripts that you wrote, the stories you wrote were stories that you could connect with personally. Would I be correct in saying that? Absolutely. And I continue. I mean, I don't think I can write a play that I don't connect with. I have been following all your plays, Mahesh. And would I be correct in stating that all the plays that you've written are a continuing, living, breathing autobiography of Mahesh Datani? Yes? Wonderful. I'm going to quote you on that. Yes. I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. Yes. But I would also like to expand the definition of autobiography. I think there is a, a biography uh, of uh, your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns, everything. And I think that's what, where I think what you said makes absolute sense to me, that it is a uh, 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 living, breathing autobiography. All my plays, uh, they are invested with my uh, thoughts, my concerns, my feelings. Your first play was Where There's a Will. Your second play, Dance Like yes. a Man, continues Absolutely. to be staged everywhere. Yeah. Didn't Alik Padamsi produce yeah. it or direct it? No, Lilette Dubey did. In fact, her production is still on. There's there's a 700 show coming up next month. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and then there were a couple of other plays. I remember this one called Twinkle Tara. That's right. That's yeah. That's the one Alec uh, produced. Uh, I, I, you know, you're among the very very few who know the original title, uh, Twinkle Tara, because that's what uh, I called it when I wrote it. And when Alec wanted to do it, he said, "I'm I want to change the title." I said, "Why?" And he said, "His marketing team." And this is where I learned professionalism. He said that his marketing people said that the title suggests a children's play, which it is not. Uh, so that's how Twinkle Tara became Tara. Well, professional or not, we Bangaloreans mm -hmm. think that we own shares in Mahesh Datani, don't we? <laughs> and we look down on people who can't remember your original play titles. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> that's the snobbery that comes with privilege of knowing. Well, I have more such snobbery. It's not bravely yeah. for the queen, you know. The title is and, and bravely, bravely for, for the, the queen. queen. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about your first earliest influences in playwriting. Earliest memory is, uh, in fact, seeing a Gujarati play called Kumarni Agashi. It means on Kumar's terrace. And in this, this very um, affluent, but still very modern middle class values, family, and the, the sort of sexuality uh, uh, that was uh, sensationalized by this group. It, it In its time, I think he wrote it in the 60s, this sort of shocked Gujarati audiences completely with what he was doing with, you know, the family unit. And then later, of course, there, there, there were American playwrights like Tennessee Williams uh, and also Edward Albee. Uh, and uh, his most famous work, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Uh, so I, I think uh, in some way, they've all influenced my earlier works. The encouragement to write it came from having read Tennessee Williams. Indian drama mm -hmm. scripts tend to be a little more flowery and uh, theatrical. You tend to have mm -hmm. a Western sensibility about the way you write. You're succinct. It's got brevity yeah. and you're direct. You're right. I mean, even if you look at modern Indian playwrights of the 60s or 70s or well into the 80s, there was a, a certain uh, treating the language as an artifice, not apologizing for the heightened nature of uh, uh, dramatic language. My aesthetics took me a little away from that. And like you rightly pointed out, uh, there's brevity uh, because I believe 
and using the language the way she is spoken and the way I hear the characters uh, uh, speak that language. I write heightened uh, dialogue too, uh, but it has this illusion of being day-to-day speech. There's a day-to-day-ness about the fragmented sentences, the the ellipses and the hyphens and things which uh, uh, which I use quite a bit. Yeah. Speaking of writing in a yeah, way that yeah. appeals more to Indian audiences, wasn't it a journalist mm. who once asked you, why don't you write in your own language? Yeah. And do you remember your response at the time? I said, I do. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't a journalist. It was actually a professor at Bangalore University who said that. Yeah, and this was at uh, at a at a seminar on theatre uh, where I was invited. Uh, but uh, you, you know, I I've never felt so roasted. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> before even I knew what the word roast was, uh, you know, they they just sort of dismissed. Uh, everything that I wrote uh, till then because it was in English. Well, I think the professor was protecting his turf, you know, as long as you lived in your little Western sandbox and produced Tennessee Williams plays, it was fine. You know, but the moment you started to stray into Indian subjects (laughs) and Indian language, ooh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's my territory. I'm going to hound you out of the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. I think that the most eloquent testimony to your relevance as an Indian writer came from Alec Padamsi. Mm. I think he said that you had given 60 million English-speaking Indians an identity. Mm. Do you remember? <laughs> yes, I do. And yes, as grand as the man himself. <laughs> yeah. A very grand statement. <laughs> but true nonetheless. Now, English language theatre in India continues to evolve and grow, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It had its time and it had its purpose, for sure, because we were a society in transition, right? A whole generation of us who were educated in English and then it became our first language. And it was never seen as a language of expression. Well, you changed it. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been a a writer who has had the same prolific scope and breadth of uh, writing. You know what? I was about to say, since you, but you're still here. (laughs) Absolutely, I'm here. (laughs) I'm not dead yet. (laughs) Okay, and now that you're not dead, what is Mahesh Dathani doing next? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I am uh, very much alive and a proof of that is that, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been sort of doing Zoom productions and there was this very delightful project that came to me, a commission from a friend of mine, Erin Me, uh, who is a very well known in India. She's known as a professor of theatre. She's written a book on Indian theatre called Theatre of Roots. Uh, she, uh, we've been in touch sort of on and off and she just sent me a mail saying, may I please commission you to write a, a play for my company? And I know her company's work because they do very site-specific work. What does that mean, site-specific? Like they would do um, a play, uh, like a podcast where the listener has to be on a boat trip around Manhattan and then things happen, so there, there's a bit of an interface between the physical space you're in and the podcast you're listening to. But uh, she couldn't do too much of it during the lockdown because there weren't people. So she started this whole uh, Plays at Home series. And so she said that, you know, just choose a portion of the house that you would like to write about. And that's where the audience is going to be invited to in their own homes. And so I wrote a play around the closet. Yeah. And I, of course, uh, you know, I translated it to a Godridge cupboard uh, because that is what the closet space is for most of us. 
Yeah, yeah. And it brings back so many fond memories of, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of wedding sarees and jewelry and everything sort of tucked away in a Godrej cupboard under a double. And an uncle's collection of Playboys. Oh, right, right. Oh, yes, there were all the unmentionables as well. Yes, absolutely. You know, there used to be a secret compartment for that kind of stuff. Curious 12-year-olds are magnets to secret stash. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so this play is actually um, about a sari, a wedding sari, locked up in the Godrej cupboard waiting for the next wedding uh, to be worn. And, but uh, surprise, surprise, this little boy opens a cupboard and gets the sari out and wears it. Right, so this this little play is about the relationship between a wedding sari and a little boy who wears wears the sari. Where can uh, people with... see this online? Oh yes, it's a, in India. That is uh, insider dot in. The title is a little drape of heaven. So we'll have a link to the tickets okay. in the podcast Good. description, and here is an excerpt from a little drape of heaven. Hello. Are you near your closet? Or a Godrej cupboard where you keep your precious clothes? Or hide something you don't want others to see? Hmm? Go on, get something interesting out of that closet. I hope you have some item of clothing that isn't usually worn by people of your gender. Be adventurous. Whatever gender you identify with, go for the other. If not a full dress or a suit, maybe a silk scarf or a jacket. Go on, I'll wait. You'll find links to A Little Drape of Heaven and other online Mahesh Datani productions in the podcast description. Maybe ironic in the context of Dance Like a Man, but Mahesh Datani, in everything you do, break a leg. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ramji. Thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast. No, thank you for agreeing to be here. Catch you soon, Mahesh. We were only human. We lack the grace. We lack the brilliance. We lack the magic to dance like God. And now it's time for that fun magic segment, What's That Word? Where we dive into the etymology of words and phrases that we use every day but never stop to think about where they came from. And to help me with this is my co host. As always, I'll let her introduce herself to you. Take it away, Pink Floyd. Hello, my name is Pranati, but you can call me P, but that's P with an A, not another E. P with an A. Oh, you can make soup with those little green things. P with another E. Just soupy. Oh, God, you. All right. P with an A. What's the word? Yeah, you just a few minutes ago, you said break a leg to Mahesh Tatani. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I know you're supposed to say this to actors instead of good luck. Mm -hmm. But but why? Okay. Speaking as a, as a musician myself, who goes up on stage every now and again. So people say break a leg to a performer as a... Just a jolly way of wishing them good luck. But never, you never say good luck or best of luck or all the best to a performer just before a show because of the fear that by saying that you might jinx the performance. You know, it's a stage person's superstition. Yeah, because the boogeyman will get them. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it is something like that. You know, as a performer, you go up on stage and you're at all times painfully aware that something can go wrong and your reputation can be shot to pieces by something that is beyond your reasonable control. So it's not a stretch to set aside one's agnosticism for the evening and embrace superstition. Yeah, that's true. Superstition does suck. So you don't like people saying good luck to you before you get on stage to play? Oh, I hate it. I can't stand what? it because... You feel bad luck? Yeah, because the spirits will wreak havoc on your good wishes and make the opposite happen. <laughs> so what's the etymology of break a leg? Right. 
The earliest known usage of break a leg wasn't even in theater. It was in horse racing. Oh. So they, yeah, it, they found out that wishing a man luck just before the horse race, which is all about luck, is considered unlucky. And people said, you should say something insulting to the person, like, may you break a leg so that you wouldn't jinx it. Yeah, I didn't I didn't really know horse racing people were superstitious, but I guess it stands to reason. Well, there's, you know, there's money involved and yeah. it's all about luck, isn't it? Yeah. So there was this uh, Irish nationalist, Robert Wilson Lind, and he published an article called A Defense of Superstition in the October 1921 edition of the New Statesman. In 1921, they had a new statesman. I wonder how old the old statesman was. In his article, he said that theater was the second most superstitious institution in England after horse racing, right? One other early use of that phrase was from the autobiography of a German fighter pilot, Manfred von Richthofen. Okay. He was the Red Baron. The Red Baron was admired everywhere, even, even among the enemies. He was supposed to be such a great fighter pilot that people set aside hatred and just admired him for how good he was. In his autobiography, the Red Baron writes that pilots of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, just before they went out on sorties or raids or whatever it is, they used the following phrase, and I'm going to try this in German. And every time I do this, it sounds like I have a speech defect, but I'm going to bludgeon on. Hals und Beinbruch. One more time. Yeah, bad chance. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> and to all our German-speaking listeners out there, you know, if I did well, let me know. Makes me happy. <laughs> the pilots said this to each other to wish each other luck and safety before a flight. But you know what it translates to? Break a leg and your neck. Oh, gosh, I shudder. But now I'm starting to believe that German soldier stereotype. <laughs> the Hollywood stereotype of the German <laughs> yeah. soldier. Well, but here's the thing. Apparently, they took that phrase from the Yiddish... Again, to my okay. Yiddish listeners, I apologize. <laughs> that has a most sedate meaning. It means success and blessing. How did all of this make it to the stage? The likely explanation is that the Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants who entered America just after the First World War also entered American entertainment in a big and visible way. And they probably brought those German and Yiddish phrases with them, and that got translated into break a leg. You know, So that's the most likely explanation of how it came into being in the entertainment industry. Yeah, that's all pretty recent. I mean, for yeah. once, this has nothing to do with ancient Greece. Um, I'm afraid it does. Ugh, of course it does. <laughs> well, the etymology concerning ancient Greece was because at, apparently at that point in time, audiences didn't clap their hands, but instead stomp their feet to show appreciation. And if a performance was very, very good, people stomped their feet so hard that they would break a leg. So, <laughs> How long did it take them to figure out they could just break ceramic plates instead of their own legs? <laughs> I see. You're, you're, you're talking about the what they do with weddings. Throw a plate yeah, exactly. Very clever, very clever. You have other legs to break here. I do. In Elizabeth in England, they bang chairs on the floor to show appreciation during a performance. A good performance may have resulted in broken legs of chairs. What do you know? Do you have something? Well, I don't really have anything much, but I do have a dad joke. Oh, pity us not. Pray tell. Okay, why do you say break a leg to theater people? I don't know. Why? Because they're in a cast. <laughs> <laughs> but I cringe. Oh, really? She cringes. I did give you a disclaimer. Well, your disclaimer is notwithstanding. There are some other suggestions for the etymology of break a leg. All right, let me rattle them off. Now, people said break a leg to wish someone such a good performance that they would have to bend their knee in a bow or curtsy. So break a leg, a very like positive. Yeah. Sure. And in a similar way, back then, you know how audiences show their appreciation, and I wish they would do that today, 
was they would throw money on the stage. And then, then the actor would break a leg by bending down to pick up the coins that they throw on the stage. Yeah, but that wouldn't work with cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> no, break a leg is, is so central to theater. And I'm wondering why that phrase has you know, never been parodied, you know, made fun of. It, it has. Really? Yeah. Uh, remind me where? In The Producers. Oh. There's a there's a song and the lyrics go, it's bad luck to say good luck on opening night. Uh, yeah, but you have to sing it. Oh, do I? Really? Yeah. Yes, completely. Okay. Here goes nothing. It is bad luck to say good luck on opening night. Very cool. Yeah, Very nobody's cool. nobody's throwing cryptocurrency at me. It won't be me anytime soon. <laughs> All right, P with an A. That was such fun. Break a leg. If you have a word or a phrase and you are curious or confused about its etymology, usage, correctness, send us a message. And we would love to have you on the show and discuss it live with you on the air. The Literary City at Explosity.com or simply TLC at Explosity.com, the Facebook group Bangalore Literary Society or Instagram, Explosity BLR. You can send us a message, slide into our DMs, whatever you like. And if your question is selected, we'll call you. While it's great fun to be educated and be able to discuss words and phrases and their nuances, let's spare a thought for the many children who would love to have the same opportunity to be educated and become thriving, contributing members of society. Many of them simply don't get an education. But the good thing is, there are many organizations who strive to bring them the education they deserve. And one of them is the Association for the Physically Disabled, or APD. It's located in Bangalore, and they do wonderful work. For years, they've run a school bringing education to little children. And as always, they could do with some help. So, we ask that you find it in your heart to head to apd-india.org or apd-india.org and make a donation, whatever you like. All the information is there on their website. And as Explosity, we have supported them for many, many years and we know the wonderful work that they do. To find out what we do, join the Facebook group, Bangalore Literary Society. Doesn't matter if you're not from Bangalore. Just join the group. It's going to be fun. Okay, that's our show. I'm Ramji Chandran. Thank you so much for listening.